So the talk today is about how to bulletproof your code. And for me, that means two things. The first thing is handling errors, logging everything you do so that when your error handling doesn't work, you can figure out what went wrong. And the second part is about design, and it's about writing your code, writing your functions in such a way that users can understand how to work with them and that they work well with others. Um, so what I mean by work well with others is, you know, you should be able to pipe things to each other and they should just work. They should work the way users expect them to, ideally. But, you know, otherwise the way you expect them to, at least. Um, so if the slides collaborate, they're not going to collaborate. It's, it's literally, so the issue is that this, see how there's all that text on the bottom? That's like the next slide and the slide after that and the slide after that all jumbled together. So the CSS isn't working for whatever reason. Um, so anyway, we're just not going to do it. We're going to read it right off of here because all the text is in the markdown anyway. So. Um. so. You, got to, you get to see the notes, that's the only difference. Oh, and also, I'm now in complete violation of the summit template. <laughs> so, before we start, like 20 minutes ago, I just want to put a disclaimer up here. My code is not actually bulletproof, no shooting guns, despite my many mistakes. You think, uh, I think you've all seen that uh, my code is not bulletproof. Um, I want, what I really wanted to say here is what I'm showing you is the latest version of my thinking, right? So if you go and look on my GitHub, you're going to find a ton of code that doesn't match up with this thought process. Um, at work, it's different. Uh, my GitHub is, frankly, if you've seen my GitHub, I write a lot of modules like Powerline and um, things that... Error handling is not like the number one priority there. Um, you know, speaking of that, this demo is not going to work either. Dang it. Um, you better be using PowerShell as your shell in here, man. I'll tell you what. Uh, do you mind if I install a module? I'm not actually sure I'm going to get a, a shell here. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, for him, no, mine does the same thing, honestly. So I totally understand that. Um, if you tried to do this on my laptop, mine would fight you the same as yours is fighting me. So that's all right. So. Um, what I want to show you is an example of, of what I mean by not handling errors right, because I'm trying to skip ahead here to catch up with myself. Um, all right. Sorry. Allow clobber. No, that's my module. So, no, no. So, um, pansies. Have you heard of pansies? I wasn't going to get into pansies because you weren't supposed to see it at all. <laughs> pansies is called pansies because it's PowerShell and C escape sequences, right? So pansies is a module for doing color in the console. Uh, it lets you do stuff like foreground, red. Actually, here, let's just put it in a quote. Foreground red, hello, with one L. And it would come out red. Um, if, if you were in a console that did color. Um, anyway, so here's the, here's, the, here's the demo for the prompt, right? You, you guys have all seen the prompt. Hopefully, um, actually, you know what? Watch this. I'm going to cheat because I'm way behind. I'm not typing it. Um, So anyway, <laughs> filling time here. The, the prompt function, um, if, you have, if you write error in your prompt function, do you know what happens? 
That's right, nothing happens. The error doesn't show up. It just does your prompt like normal. Yeah, I just realized it wasn't actually ever coming. Yay, all right. So do you see this prompt here? This is the prompt that I just pasted from up above. The two is the invocation uh, history ID. I don't know if you know this, but if you have your invocation history ID, then when you're looking back and you want to run that command that you typed earlier, you can put pound and the number and hit tab, and it fills in whatever you typed in that line, right? So I always put the invocation ID in my prompt. All right, anyway, so, so that's my prompt. It works great. Um, now, what if there was an error in it? Oop, I made my screen entirely too small here. So you see, no problems. Just ignores the error, everything just keeps going. But what if there was an exception? Well, now I don't get my prompt at all. Now I also, I also don't get the exception. So I don't know what's going on. I have to be smart enough to know that there's an error variable here and I can look at that first error and see, ah, oh, somebody threw a grenade. That makes sense. Um, in Powerline, we do things a little differently. Ah. Oh. So um, this is the same prompt, but in Powerline. In Powerline, your prompt is a collection of script blocks. So you see there's two script blocks. One's that history ID, and one is get segment path, which is a function that comes in Powerline, which returns your path as segments, which you can't really tell because I only have one folder deep here. Um, but now if we add, um, let's say we add an exception to that. Um, or actually, we'll start with an error. Yeah, yeah. So you see, all of a sudden it tells you, hey, there was an error. Actually, it says exception thrown because I only have one message rather than two. Um, it tells you, oh, you know, if you wanted to suppress this, you could. You just set hide errors. It's a setting. Um, so now the error is gone, except for the warning about the path, which is kind of a weird one. Yes, or you could use prompt if you wanted to hide the errors. So hiding the errors is really a bad idea. Interestingly, <laughs> watch this. In Powerline, if I add a thing that throws an exception, even the exception doesn't stop Powerline. You still get your prompt. Now, because I've got the hide errors turned on, it's not going to show up the error. So that's just terrible. I, I, don't, I don't That was a terrible idea. We'll just turn that off. So you see now, by the way, Whoever wrote the host for, um, for VS Code, the, uh, the two string on errors is wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it looks different if you run it in, in PowerShell.exe. It doesn't say dictionary enter. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So what's cool is we, it told us in the exception, right, to check prompt errors. So let's check that. And you can see it tells you which block with the index, the number, which one through the which error. And of course, now we know what to do to fix it. We can actually look more closely at the extra exception because that thing in the value is actually the exception. So there's the whole exception with like the stack trace through power line and everything. Um, and of course, we can put our prompt back because really, we don't need all that. All right, so back to Back to our slides. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. Um, so the idea about survivable code, we're working on this idea of error handling. So part of what we talk about with error handling is that sometimes appropriate error handling means not handling them. So in the function, in the prompt function, the PowerShell team decided that the appropriate thing to do was not handle it, except they also decided that the appropriate thing to do was not tell you about it, which I disagree with. Um, but essentially what we want to do, um, I'm, I'm going to just show you a template. I could give you this whole speech about 
why exception handling and error handling in PowerShell is weird. And sometimes exceptions aren't exceptions until they're wrapped in a try catch. Did you know that? True story. Depending on the value of error action, exceptions can be completely suppressed just by setting error action until they're wrapped in a try catch and then all of a sudden they show up, which is really bad if they happen four levels deep in your module stack, right? So here's what we do. This is our template. We put a try catch around every block and we rethrow for starters. If you find something you want to handle, like obviously you can add blocks, you can add additional catches, whatever. But the important thing here is to just make sure that there's no exceptions that are hiding from you because they weren't wrapped in a try catch. Um, so this is the this is the first step. Now, does everybody know what commandlet binding does? Okay, well, let me ask that a different way. Does anybody not know what commandlet binding does? Okay, I'm not going to explain that. Um, so the, the, the bottom line is at the bare minimum, you're going to rethrow your exceptions every time. And this way, your exception's coming from you. You're admitting that, okay, yes, I'm going to rethrow this. And then as you encounter errors that you feel like, oh, I should have handled that better, you can add error handling for that. Um, but, oh, and here's my demo. We're just breezing past. Step two is log everything. So what you, should, what you should strive for is, in the ideal world, either, well, in the ideal world, maybe you use a custom logging module, something like the PS framework logging or the information module that I have, something that lets you say, I'm going to say, write log, and here's my statement. But put it in, let's say, every block in every if statement, right? If you've got an if else, put it in the else too. That way when you're, well, when the inevitable happens and something happens deep inside during a deployment and you can't figure out where it is, you can look at your log trace and you can say, well, it went through this path and then we don't know what happened, but it stopped after this message, right? So at least you're in the right place. Um, but also, uh, I want to point this out. If you don't know about the information stream and tagging, if you have this code in a function and you call that function with dash IV drip, information variable, right? Um, but it's funnier if it's an IV drip. <laughs> so um, then you can, do, you can do drip where tag contains exception, and it'll just output that second one, not the first one, because you can tag them, and you can filter by the tags later. Now, the really cool thing is that here I'm, here, I'm writing an exception into the information stream. That thing is an object, and it goes into the object. And we, when I do this export CLI XML down here, I actually get the, uh, the actual exception object in my log. So when I'm finding out later about this problem and I pull it up and I go look at the log, I can pull up the exception. I can see the stack trace and all the other parts. I don't have to manually write out. Because what I used to do is anytime we caught an exception, you'd write the exception message and then the stack trace, and then you do exception.inner exception and do that one, and then exception.inner exception and do that one. Yeah. So definitely log everything. And oh, another point about the information stream, which my notes reminded me of, is that um, everything that goes in the information stream is time stamped and stamped by the computer and the username. So every record that goes in there has your, the name of the user that was running the script and the computer that it ran on, and the time that that executed at. Um, it's really great for logging. Um, so we're going to go back up to, you know, there was actually a, in the slide deck, things go up and down. But anyway, we're going to go back up to, to talk about design a little bit more, but I want to summarize the, the exception stuff, right? Always put a try catch around your process block, end block, begin block. Only handle specific exceptions. So if you, when you have that catch that catches everything, rethrow. If you know what you want to do with an exception, handle that particular exception by name, right? Um, and then always log, especially exceptions. Um, and by the way, I put a note here, even verbose output counts, right? So if you don't want to mess around with information stream and information action and log and all this, if you do write verbose, 
then at least in your deployments, in those places where you're running it unattended, you can always run things with verbose preference continue and just dump it. We use at work, we actually use a PS logging module by Dave uh, Wyatt. And um, that thing captures all the streams to a file, right? So we just write verbose. Ever in, like when I was talking about before, like in each, when you go into a block, if in each statement in a switch, whatever, you just write verbose. And then when you wrap it in PS logging, all that logging comes out. It's pretty good. All right, so let's talk about usable commands. What does it mean for a command to be usable? It means for it to be intuitive, discoverable, for it to play well with other commands. Um, it's about commands that make sense and work together. It's about commands that people can use without reading the help. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about process here. You might have seen on the first slide that I identify with battle faction. The truth is despite that, I'm never quite happy with a module until all the commands have been sort of um, reduced to the minimum common number of nouns that I can get to. Um, and I want everything to pipe into everything. So that's what this talk comes out of. Um, I want you to think when you're designing your commands about how the command is gonna be used. So what are you gonna call the command? How are you gonna call the command? What's the command for? What parameters are you gonna pass to it? Um, what, um, what are you gonna do with the output? Are you outputting it to screen and you need to deal with how it's gonna be formatted? Are you passing it to another command and you're really just trying to cram as much information into it as possible so that the other command can use the information? Um, and when other people are using it, how are they gonna know how to get the information that you want as a parameter? and what you want. So it's a good idea to start by writing down some examples of how you think it might be used. So just kind of diagram it, write it out. Just literally pseudocode it, say, you know, well, we're gonna write, for, as an, for an example here, we're gonna write a command that is, I, I showed you this template, right? Um, this command is what we're gonna try to do. Import configuration. I want to load settings from my module. Um, and I, I, I don't know what parameter it needs, um, so I gotta think about what that means. Because what I really want is I wanna call this command inside of a module, and it should just work. I wanna just say import configuration. I don't wanna tell it what module I'm in. It should figure that out, right? Um, so as you're, as you're designing, you need to think about that. So in my simplest case, right, my simplest case, the example is, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna call $config equals import configuration. And it should export what? So think about what that's gonna mean. What is it gonna export, right? Um, and then write it down. And the way I want you to write it down is very specific, okay? I want you to write it down like this. You with me? Does everybody recognize comment-based help when you see it. This is where you write your example, okay? Don't just jot it down on a piece of paper. Don't try it in PowerShell. Write it down in your help. And then when you're done writing it down in your help, by the way, do you see I thought of another example? I wanna do import configuration. I wanna be able to set a property and then export it. So now I've got a whole other command I need to write, export configuration. And it needs to work with piping the config object to it. Um, when you start writing out the complete examples, hopefully, um, hopefully you'll get that I'm serious, that just literally put them in your help. So the first thing you do is you write your help. There's three things that you need to have in your help. And, and I'm gonna like, this is gonna be one of those where I'm gonna, normally you're gonna be stuck on this slide and I'm gonna talk to you, but now I'm gonna have to scroll because you're gonna see the notes. But there's three things, right? The first is the synopsis. Um, the reason why the synopsis comes first is because Help doesn't show up until you add a synopsis. Um, so always write the synopsis. But the other thing about the synopsis is it's the brief description of what your command does for somebody else to read and understand what your command does. So this is gonna force you to think about what, what are you writing and why are you writing it, right? Um, you, I will encourage you to also write a description 
Uh, the description is supposed to be longer and more detailed. But don't write it now. Write it after you finish the command. Because if you write it now, it's probably going to be wrong anyway. Then the second thing you need to write is examples. Um, one example for each parameter set, please. If you have a parameter set and you can't think of an example, get rid of the parameter set. <laughs> Honest, seriously. Um, I have had to say this. But the other thing is um, maybe you don't know what the mandatory parameters are for your, for your examples. Because what I want you to do, right, you don't need to write an example for every parameter. You do need to write an example for every parameter set. And in those examples, you need to show me how to set. You need to show me examples of actual values to pass. Don't like cheat and just put a, a dollar name, right? Um, give me an example of what goes in there. And make sure that you have all the mandatory parameters in. And if you don't know what those are, don't worry about it yet. You can come back and add them as you figure it out, right? These are, lot, these are living documents. You get to update them. Um, now, the reason why you don't need every parameter in your examples is because the third piece of help that you're going to write is parameter documentation, <laughs> right? So when you're writing your function, don't, OK, do me a favor. Don't write dot parameter at the top and write your help there. Write your parameter help as a comment directly above the actual parameter inside the param block. And the reason is you're going to actually remember to update it when you change the parameter name later. Um, it's easier to forget than you would think. Um, so the next thing we're going to do after we finish writing our help is write tests. And why are we going to write tests next? Well, because we just wrote all these examples, and we want to make sure the examples actually stay working. So we're going to write a test for each of the examples that we've just written. Um, and the test should basically be, well, how about this? I'll tell you this. Think of your test as documentation, right? Essentially, I'm going to skip over testing, because I'm. this is not the testing talk. There are three other testing talks this week. Um, but, but approach your test as documentation. Think of it as documenting your design, what you meant for the commands to do, and the fact that it works, right? Because this is the point, is that your tests are going to prove that your examples work. And if your examples ever stop working, you'll know because your tests break. It's really frustrating and embarrassing as an author if somebody comes and says, hey, I tried the third example from your help, and it doesn't work. Don't be that guy. There's a couple of those in the PowerShell history that have actually shipped in the box. And we've had to update help afterwards. You, you, want, you want to know why help can be updated afterwards? Yeah, that's why. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know um, this, the, the, the next piece, OK, so this is start with writing your examples, uh, write your tests. And the third piece is think about naming. Just pause for a minute and think about naming. And I don't mean the name of your command, OK? Hopefully, you've spent some time thinking about the name of command. Everybody has to, because we have like this short list of verbs that are approved. And your nouns have to be singular. And sometimes that means we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out how to rename the command, because the noun that we want doesn't work when it's singular. It makes no sense, that kind of thing. But what I want you to think about is the parameters. And the reason is because I think that the parameter names are actually the most important part of your function. Because your, your, your command name, somebody's going to, like, let's say you wrote the module power line, right? And somebody's coming in here and they're like, well, what commands does that have? They're just going to do get command module power line, right? And now they know what commands are in there. They don't need help finding these now, right? And ideally, they'll be able to tell what they do from the name. But the parameters are a whole other matter because they're not this um, in your face. We don't have standards for them, right? Um, now, there are some standards. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. So looking at our example, um, I'm going to go to, to this import configuration, right? I've written some examples um, for the help. Um, I've added one here. Um, this one is, I'm, I, I really want this to work. So I want, from outside the module, I want to be able to say get module and import configuration so I can look at the configuration of your module without being your module. Does that make sense? 
Because as a user, I want to edit the configuration from outside. Um, so that's one piece I want. But when I'm, when I'm naming this parameter, so here's this parameter, right? It is a PS module info. Should we name this thing module, PS module info, module info, or something else entirely? How about, like, show of hands for PS module info. Nobody wants to call it PS module info. Interesting. How about show of hands for module info? How about, how about show of hands for module? Okay, so we're kind of split half and half on module info module. I'll tell you why I decided on module. And this is what I, this is the thought process I want you to kind of go through. Like, why do I call it? What do I call it? So we, I, I was initially leaning towards module info because I want to communicate to the user. You can't put a module name here, right? You need to pass a module info object. Um, and then I started thinking about whether I can actually make it so that you could put a module name here. Because I can put an argument transform. Have you guys seen argument transforms? I could write an argument transform that would turn a name into a PS module info. OK. So if I do that, then module would be all right. But what about, I mean, really, module info is still clearer, right? I mean, really. But what about where is the value going to come from for this thing. So where am I going to get one of these objects? Get module. So why is that thing not called get module info? Dang it. They just wrecked the naming. But because it's named get module, and most people don't know what the name of the object that comes out of it is, right? It's probably a good idea for me to call mine module rather than module info, because nobody knows that get module doesn't actually output modules. It actually outputs module infos. Actually, PS module infos. And I'm definitely not calling it PS module info because that's smacks of a prefix that I'm not really allowed to use because I'm not on the PowerShell team. So <laughs> we're definitely not doing that. So now I did. This is on my list. So I want to I want to I want to do one last stop before I go there though. Um, the other place that does anybody know another place I can get a module info object. No, they output something else entirely. I'll give you a hint. It's a property on another object that you use this command all the time. Get command, that's right. And on the get command, the command has a property, and that property's name is module. So we're going with module, that's it. So now I can put value from polypine by property name, and I can actually pipe commands to this thing and look up the, without even knowing what module they came from. So this is what I'm, do you, you guys follow me? This is what I want you to go through when you're naming parameters because this is what's going to actually help you get your names right. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit here about what makes a good parameter name. And there's four points, recognizable and specific, implicitly typed, distinct and consistent. And I'll go into details here. So recognizable and specific. A good example, path. A better example, file path or directory path. Because now you know, oh, I don't want directory paths. I want file path. Um, how about name versus first name or full name, right? Well, much better if you have that hint that what I really want is your whole name, not just part of it. Um, users should be able to tell by looking at your parameter name what information you actually want. Uh, otherwise, they're going to pass the first name to a parameter that wants a full name, and you're going to have a validator on it that goes, oh, there's no space in your name. You didn't pass me a full name. And they're like, well, because you didn't tell me, right? Um, and you're going to say, but it's in the help. So the second thing is implicitly typed. And so here we're talking about users being able to guess what type of information you want, um, but also what the units are. So my, my, my favorite is when you have a timeout switch and it doesn't say timeout seconds or timeout milliseconds. Because if I pass milliseconds to one that was seconds, I'm going to be here a really long time. <laughs> so definitely do that, right? Um, color. 
right? In, in, the, in the console right now, we usually use console color as a replacement. We don't say color, we say console color. And the reason is because there's an actual type in an enum called console color. But if we didn't have console color, <clears throat> pansies. In the, in the right host here, check this out. We, um, we replaced right host, right? So the right host now takes a background color, which is an RGB color, and a foreground color, which is also an RGB color. And I don't know why the help shows those differently. Um, that's actually really neat. They're the same type, I promise. Um, so the, the deal is actually, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off script here for a second. Wait, you were using Windows PowerShell. Yeah, because we've been on script so well so far, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Is your start menu just totally broken? That's really awesome. Um, all right. Um, so I can do right host, foreground color, pink. Hello. Oh. Okay, Ipmo pansies. Sorry. What? Oh, pink is not a val. Uh, sorry. Um, wheat. Oh, <laughs> heat. Not heat. <laughs> Wheat. Why is wheat? Shift W didn't work at all. I don't know. That's just really weird. Let's try CSS values because that's just more fun anyway. Right? Um, any any of these different? Sure. Because he finally figured out how to type it. <laughs> um, it's funny, you can barely tell those apart. Oh, you can. All right, I can barely tell those apart. Um, any CSS color value will go in here. So um, back to our regularly scheduled disaster. Um, <laughs> you want to know what types you can pass, right? So if you want a color name, tell me a color name. If you want an RGB color, tell me RGB color. If you want a console color, tell me console color. Um, and then the next step is distinct. So here we're talking about saving the user's time by letting them type as little as possible before they can hit tab. Um, so for instance, my good example is allow clobber and allow pre-release. Could we call that first one ignore command name? Because who knows what clobber means anyway in this context? And allow pre-release would be fine if we had renamed the other one ignore command names. Um, the, the, it's funny that that came up in the, in the unscripted portion of our demo. Um, <laughs> but also, you also want to avoid common, uncommon terms like clobber. Um, I mean, I guess you can use clobber now because everybody's learned it. But um, in general, you want to try to avoid terms that people won't recognize. Um, and then you want to avoid similarity. And by similarity, I mean like, um, oh, like this. This is just my favorite. And we're doing it over here because uh, the, the IntelliSense stuff doesn't work in the console. Uh, can I? It actually does. Uh, in the, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, it, let's just say it works sometimes and it doesn't work others and I'm not trusting it on your laptop. <laughs> so um, do you guys know that you can hit control space and get a, a menu for tab completion? Does anybody have any idea, like can you name like half of these and tell me what they do? Because there are a lot of options here and some of them seem really weird. Like did you ever want, this is something I, I Install package all versions. Hmm. 
that sounds great. Let's try that. Now, do you see what just happened? Unable to install multiple packages matching Pansy. Well, yeah, because I set all versions. What is the point of that switch? I don't even know. So, so the moral of the story is when you're naming your parameters and you've got this like, um, try going in your function, like after you've named your parameters, Try coming in here and hitting control space. And make sure that each one of your parameters is obviously useful. Meaning people should look at it and go, oh, I know what that does, right? Um, you don't want to have like three different ways to pass the same information. So my other example is um, if you want the user to give you a username and password, ask them for a credential. Don't ask them for a username and password, right? And, and by the way, for goodness sakes, don't do both. Um, it's much better for the user to have to figure out how to get a credential than for them to have to figure out which one they should pass. Because you're going to feel like an idiot when some user says, um, so when should I use username and when should I use credential? And you're like, they're the same. And they're like, well, why are there two? Don't do that. Um, and then consistent, and by consistency, I'm talking about matching the properties on your output objects and your input objects, and matching the parameter names that you use for the same value on your other commands or on other common PowerShell commands, right? So I'll let you off the hook if you use uh, a parameter that's kind of weird, like allow clobber, because people know it from install module, right? And so you, they are, they're going to intuitively guess what it means when they see it. But that's the, that's the point here is to help people be able to figure things out really quickly. So if you've got objects that have property names and you can match that property name on your input, do that because it will help people. They'll see it multiple times. They'll see it on the output. They'll see it on the input. Um, and then the same thing for output. Now, of course, the other thing is that when you're doing it on the input, you're also allowing yourself to pipe objects in, right? And there's a whole series of demos that we are obviously not going to get to about. Um, piping things in um, and how value from pipeline by property name versus value from pipeline. So when you're doing this, I want everybody to start writing. Where's the, where's the process there? Process first. So I showed you that in that first template, if you recall, right? Oh, it's not a touch screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> process, right? I, Always start this way, start with process. Why? Because then your command is going to work in the pipeline. When you find stuff that you're like, um, this is not going to work in the pipeline. I really don't want that to happen in the pipeline. Then you add a begin block, then you add a process block. And then when you're done, so let's say 90% of commands you could probably just write entirely in the process block. When you get done with your command, come back and optimize it. And the way that you optimize it, the way that you optimize it is you're going to come in and you're going to say, well, OK, now let me, let me just say, when I talk about optimizing, I'm talking about perf. Okay? So one of the reasons we're doing process block instead of end block is because creating a command instance, right? when, you, when you call a command, PowerShell actually creates an object, which is your command. And that costs time. And then they call the methods on it, process, 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 process. But if you don't have a process and you instead have an end, then they have to create the command every time through the loop, right? So when you're looping, you're doing that for each object and you're calling your command over and over. So this will actually, just moving everything into process will speed you up most of the time. But in order to get the biggest gain on perf, what you want to do is look for stuff that isn't actually needed to be done every time, right? So like when you're doing a move, let's say, think about move item, right? Uh, when we do move item, we want that destination to be only one, right? We don't want a, every object coming through has its own destination. Um, so we're going to put destination. We're going to not tag that value from pipeline. And then in our uh, module where we're checking to see if the folder exists, we're going to do that in the begin block because now it doesn't have to happen over and over and over when we checked it the first time, right? So, But don't do that 
until you're basically done and you're ready to ship and you're like doing your final code review. Because if you pre-optimize, you're going to find yourself moving stuff back and forth. Don't ask me how I know this. You're going to find yourself moving stuff back and forth from process to begin and from begin to process. Oh, that needs to go in the end block, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's basically the, what I have. There's some notes here about um, types and how, to, how you should write types. I have a great example that you're not going to get to see about argument transformation attribute. Check this out. I'm going to do the demo. Watch. Copy path. Oh, and this demo is going to throw an exception because the file's not going to exist, but that's all right. Um, so on my, on my computer, I pre-created the file that this is going to look for. Um, so let me show you the, right, the, the last version of our import configuration. In the import configuration, it's doing this. Join path, app data, module company name, module name, and then import localized data with that path and the file name configuration.psd1. So um, on mine, there was a file in that spot, but there isn't here. So I'm going to dot source this, and then we're going to call get module. Yeah. Get module. Pansies. Import. Right? Ooh, that was fun. Actually, what I, that's not the demo I want to run anyway. I want to put dash module pansies, right? Um, oh, there you go. So that's the error I wanted. The file doesn't exist. You see that? So the file doesn't exist because I didn't create it ahead of time like I did on my system. But the key thing that you're, that you're looking for here is that when I passed in a string, the argument transformation attribute, which looks like this, and it's really, these are really easy to write. I want you to see how easy this is, right? So literally, I just create a module info attribute. By the way, the really easy way, actually, let's just look at the other version, because this one's simpler, because um, I put a using at the top. Using namespace saves you so many characters. So now I've got module info attribute. I'm choosing to call it module info attribute because I want to type module info, right, and my, with parentheses. So it's an argument transformation attribute. And it has to implement just this one method, right? Engine intrinsics and input data. You're going to ignore the engine intrinsics because you don't care because you're not doing file lookups or anything like that. And you're just going to say, look, if the input data is a string and it's not, well, we could even skip the null or white space check, but that's not in my DNA. Um, if the input data is a string and it's not empty, then just call get module. And if get module doesn't return the module, then try get module list available and return the first one, right? Um, and if we didn't find one, then throw, we couldn't find the module. And if we did, return the module info, right? So now if you pass a string and it's not a module info object. Now what I need to do down at the bottom here is I need to put a, um, if input data, I need to put an else if input data is a module info, return the input data. That's what I missed, uh, which is why that first error happened. Because um, right now, this argument transformation is trying to transform module info objects. So I need a, an extra case here. Um, but anyway, that's basically it. You just literally look at the object and you say, give me the object that I wanted from that. Um, and that's all you have to do. And now that, th that little thing just improves the usability of that command tenfold. Oh, yeah, yeah. You just put it down there, decorate it. And of course, because I have the using at the top, I can shorten PS module info to PS module info. So you literally just put the attribute on there like that, and magic happens whenever a string comes in. Cool? All right, now all this is up. This is the, I'm supposed to do the thank you slide, right? Um, if you thought my presentation was awesome, my name is Joel Bennett. Otherwise, I'm Kirk Monroe, everybody. <laughs> um.